Hello and welcome back to Her Hoop Stats Unplugged. As always, you're here with Megan Gower and happy holidays, happy new year. It's been a little bit since our last episode, but we are back for 2023 and the new year also means that we are already somehow almost two months into the NCAA women's basketball season. Been a lot of chaos, a lot of upsets, a lot happening even in just the last week to talk about today. So plenty of stuff to get into in this episode. Before we do that, just a little bit of housekeeping coming into the new year. We're excited that we are moving over to the Learfield podcast platform I'm very excited about the change. What that means for you as a listener is not much. You'll still get the podcast in all the same places you expect to. Nothing should change from your end. The only thing that will change is as we move into the new year, you're going to start hearing ads on the podcast if you listen on Spotify, Apple, any of the, the podcast hosting sites. So just a, a quick update there that you might hear start hearing some ad reads on the podcast, which is a change we're very excited about here at Her Hoop Stats. But without further ado, we want to jump into the first episode of the Her Hoop Stats podcast for 2023. I'm going to be doing a solo episode again today, so similar to what we did a little bit a few weeks ago. But if, like me, you spent the last week eating a lot of cookies on the couch and maybe not paying as much attention to everything as you normally do. I certainly fell into that boat. I'm um, going to start off with a little bit of a recap of just everything that's gone on over the last week or so. We've had the start of conference play and all of our major conferences, a lot of exciting stuff happening there. And then on the, the second half of the show here, going into uh, some New Year's resolutions for each of the top five teams. We got a new AP poll yesterday with all the shakeups that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes here. There's been a lot of changes at that top. So that top five, not much change at one and two. That's still South Carolina, Stanford, but then Ohio State, Notre Dame, UConn, so the top five teams in the country right now. Those are the teams that have looked the best so far this season, but of course they all have things that they can improve upon. So kind of trying to pick out the one thing for each of those teams that I'd like to see more of as we go into the new year and we make our way through January and eventually get to a place where it's almost time to start talking about March. It's not as far off as it seems. So lots of exciting things coming in the college basketball world. But to start off, the last couple weeks, have been crazy. Just starting kind of from the holidays, like I said, we have the start of conference play. So Big Ten, ACC, SEC, Big 12, really all the major conferences, even Big East, having a lot of different things happening to start things off after the holidays. We get a top five loss, the first top five loss of the week. Indiana suffers their first loss of the season of course, Indiana is still without Grace Berger. I think we are getting close to the timetable of her return, so hopefully the Hoosiers will see her back soon. But without their senior leader on the floor, they finally drop a game to Michigan State, uh, 78-83 to 83 loss for Indiana. Really just the, the turnovers killed them in that matchup. 21 turnovers for the Hoosiers. They all shot 25% from three. Two things that were just too much for them to over, overcome, especially without Grace Berger on the floor. And Michigan State holds hands them their first loss of the season, but also their first conference loss, which is going to be important as I think we talk about later down the road, the Big Ten standings and dropping one of those games. That's not to that, that top echelon of Big Ten teams this season. I think could hurt them in that conference place later on in the year. But I think I'm obviously most important thing for Indiana right now is I think if you get Grace Berger back, you're in a really good spot. And then on the same day of that Indiana loss, the first day of ACC play, this day did not disappoint at all. I think we all knew going in the ACC was top heavy. It had a lot of depth. This league was going to be exciting. And the first day of it made it very clear that those were the right expectations to have for the league. Three top 15 teams fall to unranked opponents in that first day. So Clemson takes down Virginia Tech. 
Virginia Tech is still without Ashley Owusu, who I think is going to be a huge part of that team when they get her back. But Clemson takes them down 64 to 59, a tough way for Virginia Tech to start ACC play. Then Florida State takes down North Carolina 78 to 71. Florida State's freshman Tania Lotson, who I think is pretty clearly the front runner for freshman of the year right now, had 21 points in that game. Seminoles didn't quite make it into the AP poll this week after that win, but they are sitting at that second spot out of the poll. So definitely a team I think we will probably see in the top 25 at some point this season if they can continue finding success in the ACC. And then Duke also takes down NC State in that first day of ACC play. A big win for the Blue Devils, 72 to 58. And they also go on on Sunday to be Louisville. So they're now 12-1 and on the season. Their only loss is to UConn. So Duke has skyrocketed back into the poll. They came in at number 19 this week. I think a team to probably keep an eye on. I still don't think they're part of that top tier of the ACC, but maybe a team that could prove me wrong there. I think I'm definitely going to be circling some of their bigger matchups going into ACC play and a team that even if they don't surprise and fall into the top of the ACC standings, a team I don't think anyone's going to want to see in their path when they get to the ACC tournament in March, which I'm sure is going to be chaos if that first day is any indication. Also on that first day, Notre Dame escapes adding a, a fourth team to the upset list for the ACC, but they scraped by Miami at 66-63 win. Olivia Miles was just two rebounds short and assist short of a triple-double in that game, so another huge performance from her to get Notre Dame in the win column, which I think, especially looking at how the other top teams in the league fell that day, is a really good sign for the Irish if they're chasing an ACC title. And then kind of wrapping up just a few more things in the ACC, not that first day, but first weekend on Sunday, we get a matchup between two of those top teams, Virginia Tech and UNC. Virginia Tech is able to hand UNC their fourth loss of the season. It's a close one, 68-65. So close game there, but Virginia Tech comes out with the win and UNC falls further in the ACC standings. And then NC State just narrowly uh, avoids being joining UNC is a team with with two ACC losses in that first weekend. They scraped by Syracuse by just two points. So I think something to keep an eye on there. NC State, of course, also dealing with injuries. I feel like it's just the theme across women's college basketball right now. But they are without Diamond Johnson. So hopefully they will get her back soon. And a huge piece of what they do. And probably a big reason for some of those results this past week. Moving over to the SEC, we've got LSU finally plays a top 25 game. It only took two months, but we get to see the Tigers against Arkansas. So a real test, I think the first thing that at least resembles a real test for LSU. And they pass it pretty easily. 24 point win over Arkansas. Arkansas falls out of the poll after that. But I think the thing that stood out to me most was 19 points and 16 rebounds for Angel Reese, who's been so good all season long, but to see her then go and do it against a quality opponent as well, I think just speaks to what we can expect to see from Angel Reese night in and night out for this LSU team. The other thing that stuck out to me from LSU was they won the rebounding margin against Arkansas 62 to 30. That's a huge rebounding advantage. Um, no surprise, I guess, from a Kim Mulkey coach team that they're going to go after the boards, but I think LSU has at least proved that they are a very good team. I don't know if we've seen enough to know that they're really truly a top 10 team, how good they are. I think the rest of SEC play will tell us kind of where they actually fall, but we at least get to see them against a quality opponent for the first time. Pac-12 play also getting underway. Um, UCLA on the road with the Oregon road trip to start off their season in the Pac-12 they get a big road win at Oregon, but Charisma Osborne hurt her shoulder in that game. I haven't seen a timetable for a return. Hopefully it'll be quick, but the Bruins do drop their second game of the season to Oregon State without Osborne in the second game of that road trip. 
That's their just their second loss, the first one coming in that game where they played South Carolina very closely. Um, so definitely, obviously, not that surprising without Charisma Osborne. She's really the kind of heart and soul of that team. And between her and Kiki Rice really carry the team so far. So hopefully they get Osborne back soon. Um, and then elsewhere in the Pac-12, not a surprising result, but at least worth noting that we got the, a ranked matchup between Stanford and Arizona. Stanford took down Arizona 73 to 57 in that one, so was able to handle, uh, I think they were ranked 15 at the time, Arizona pretty easily. Going back over to uh, Big Ten play, we started off with Indiana, but um, the, over the weekend, Ohio State and Michigan faced off in Big Ten, and Ohio State is able to come out with the win there, even without J.C. Sheldon and Madison Green. More unfortunate injury news is that Madison Green is out to the season. Sheldon is still week to week for the Buckeyes, so they are expecting to get her back. But a huge win for Ohio State to come out on top in that game without those two really big pieces in their lineup, they forced 27 turnovers for Michigan, which is just too much for Michigan to overcome. And Ohio State gets a big win in Big Ten play, sitting them kind of in sole position right now of first place in the Big Ten standings. Part of that sole possession of first place is Iowa also suffered their fourth loss of the season in Big Ten play this weekend. They Illinois takes them down, so it beats them at home. That Illinois team is now set the first team actually outside of the AP poll. So they're basically 26 team in the country. If you're looking at the AP poll, um, getting some well-deserved votes there. But Illinois just really able to outplay them in that game. Shoots 52% from the floor and out-rebounded Iowa to get that win there. It was a, a 90 to 86 win. So no shortage of offense, but definitely shortage of some defense in that one. And then lastly... This is a, a good game earlier this week on Monday. Georgia or South Carolina headed to Georgia for their first SEC road trip of the season. Georgia was able to make South Carolina sweat a little bit in the first half. They had the Bulldogs had the lead at halftime, gave us a bit of an interesting game. Um, I think maybe Georgia team to circle in terms of as you're looking at the top of the SEC. There's not a lot of great teams in the SEC this year, but I think Georgia, a team that could fall in that, that top three type spot in the SEC possibly. Um, but South Carolina goes on to win the game by 17, so no no real surprises there. A really huge game for South Carolina by Zaya Cook. She had 31 points, hit a couple of really, really big threes for them in the second half to create some some separation. So South Carolina, once again, showing that they can win in a variety of different ways. That Cook was the only player in double figures, but she had 31, so was able to carry them to that win. So another solid win for South Carolina as well. All right, so... Obviously, plenty happening in the last week. Lots more coming in the coming weeks with conference play underway. A lot to be excited about looking around. A lot of these top conferences, like we said, lots of upsets already. I expect to see a lot more than that. And I also am excited to see kind of which teams in these leagues can really separate themselves and stand out as you know the best teams in the country, I think. A lot of times with non-conference play and different strengths of schedules, it's really hard to see who that group is, but conference play should tell us a lot about that, which is exciting. On that note, looking at least at who the top five teams are in the country right now, making some New Year's resolutions for each of these teams, things I just, I think, stand out to me so far, what would take these teams that are obviously already really, really good and take them to the next step and make them that much better. I'm just going to go through them in order as they are the AP people. So starting off, South Carolina. We've talked about South Carolina can win in a variety of ways. They are undefeated so far this season, have a huge win over number two Stanford, have really proven that they believe they deserve to be in that number one spot so far this season. The one thing that stands out to me, though, on the South Carolina team is obviously one of their strengths is their depth. They've gone deep into their bench in every game. They can get production from a lot of different players on their roster. They can play a really extended rotation. 
But the thing that seems to that has cost is how much Aaliyah is Boston is touching the ball. And I think one of this team's other greatest strengths is that you have the best player in the country on your team. And while South Carolina maybe hasn't needed to use her to that degree in these games that they've played so far, I think we will get to a point, whether it's in the regular season and the SEC tournament in March, where they need Leah Boston to dominate. And we haven't really seen that yet this season, and which concerns me is that she, I feel like, also isn't necessarily maybe touching the ball as much as she should in certain games. So I think the one thing I would like to see from South Carolina going into the year is just a little bit more of them feeding at Leah Boston side, finding ways to get their national player of the year the ball so that when they're in a situation, whenever it happens, when they need to get her the ball, they're able to do so. Right now, she's only averaging 7.4 field goal attempts per game. Her usage rate is only 20%. Both of those are career lows for her, which, again, I think speaks to South Carolina's depth. But I just think that this team is going to reach a point where they need her to be the player that she can be. And setting themselves up for success would look like feeding her more now so that they can get her the ball when they have to in crunch time in games. For Stanford, on a similar note in that we're picking on a particular player, but I think the biggest thing that sets the tone for Stanford and how far they can go this season is, can Cameron Brink stay out of foul trouble? She Her foul rate is down from last season or from her first two seasons to give some credit to Cameron Brink, but I think it's still something we've seen her struggle with where she spends long stretches on the bench in the first half after picking up early fouls or even in the second half. And the Stanford team is just a very different team with her on and off the floor, which I think is very going to be very important as they go into the depths of Pac-12 play and then also into March. Uh, Stanford's net rating with Karen Brink on versus off is 18.3 points higher, which is insane in its own right. But that's primarily also on the defensive end, and I think – at times when Cameron Brink is not on the floor, we see Stanford's defense struggle to guard teams. And I think that's going to be very important when you look at the top of Pac-12 play and trying to not – or being able to keep up with everyone in the top of the Pac-12. And then also, of course, when you get to March and tournament time and things like that, having Cameron Brink on the floor is going to make Stanford a much better defensive team, which is going to make it a lot easier for them to win games. And I think that's going to be the biggest thing to watch for with this team is can they find ways to work on that? Can they improve on that? Can Cameron Brink just play smarter and not pick up fouls where she doesn't need to? So they can have her on the floor, the way she alters shots, the way she alters, the way teams have to guard Stanford on the other end as well offensively is just too big for Stanford to be sacrificing her, having her on the court for large stretches of the game. So number three team in the country right now, Ohio State. So we talked about earlier, they just picked up a big win over Michigan despite being without some, some key pieces in their lineup. How do you look at this team? I think what makes them so good is their press on the defensive end, their ability to turn teams over better than any other team in the country. They're creating those turnovers that turns into easy offense for Ohio State, so they're able to get easy buskets, but also able to really limit their opponents on their offensive end with just not giving them a lot of opportunities to shoot the ball because they're turning it over so often. But when you look at Ohio State's number, one thing that stands out to me is their rebounding. So they don't rank in the top 100 in a single rebounding metric. They're highest or their best ranked metric is their defensive rebounding rate, which is the only one of those metrics that's in the top half of the country in terms of rankings. I think we've seen, obviously, they're undefeated currently. Against a lot of teams, it hasn't caused an issue for them. The turnovers, what they're able to do disruptively on defense is still enough for them to get the win. But I think when you look at Ohio State against the other top teams in the country, that rebounding could become an issue for them. I also think it's just hard to win if you're looking at a team that's number three in the country, you're talking about national championship aspirations. And I think it's hard to win a national championship 
if you don't have a strong presence on the glass when you get to that level. So much of it comes down to the little things. And of course, forcing turnovers is one of them, but getting the rebounds when you need to is another one. And I think if Ohio State could make strides in that department and just be a better rebounding team as they move through conference play, that will go a long way for them as they get into the postseason. Of course, having, you know, J.C. Sheldon, having some of their key pieces back will probably help with that, but just something to keep an eye on with the Buckeyes. Then the number four team in the country right now is Notre Dame. So right now at the top of the ACC standings, probably I would say pretty fairly the good the favorite to win the ACC, which is no small feat this season if they are able to, to do that. The one thing that stands out for me for the Irish, and I think we've seen this kind of throughout the season from them, is I think how far this team can go is largely attached to how good can Lauren Ebo, the Texas transfer, be for Notre Dame. We've seen games where she's been really, really good. I think one that stands out is their win over UConn. She had a fantastic game in that win over UConn. The game right before that that they lost to Maryland, she didn't have a great performance. And she's kind of still struggled with that inconsistency throughout the start of the season. Um, Notre Dame picked up a big win at Virginia Tech, was huge in getting that, Lauren Ebo was huge in getting that win. And then the next game she, against Western Michigan, she fouled out in 15 minutes. She had a double-double against Miami, but that was really quiet against Boston College. So Notre Dame hasn't been able to kind of get consistent production from Lauren Ebo on the glass in the lane. And I think if they can reach that next level from her where they can get the big-time performances she's shown that she can have, night in and night out, that's going to make this team so much better and so much more competitive in the lane and make them a team that you're talking about as a national championship contender. And then lastly, the number five team in the country right now is UConn. I could take the route to say they need to get healthy as a New Year's resolution, but obviously that's something they have control over. Hopefully things are looking up in the right direction. AZ Fund is cleared and hopefully should be back soon for the Huskies. One thing that stands out for them is the turnovers. They're currently averaging 17.1 turnovers per game, turning the ball over 20% of their possessions. Both of those metrics rank in the bottom half of the country. You could, of course, attribute some of that to FUD's absence, to just the different lineups the Huskies have had throughout the season. But I think in general, it is still a pretty large issue for UConn right now. Even with those turnovers, they're still in the hoop sets ratings. They're top three. Their offense is top three. They're first in field goal percentage. But if they could clean up those turnovers, it could just make their offense that much better going as we go on in the season. I also think as much as UConn has played a tough schedule, you still haven't played, you know, a lot of other side from the Notre Dame game, which they lost without easy FUD. You you still haven't played a lot of like top five-ish type opponents. And I think turnovers is one of those things, like we said, with rebounds for Ohio State when you're playing the top tier teams in the country, little things like that are enough to cost you a game. And I do think that that turnovers could be an issue for UConn as you look ahead. They've got a game of South Carolina coming up in February. And then as you look ahead to March as well. So I think a big thing for UConn is, is cleaning up that turnovers and, and being able to correct that going going forward this season. So we'll see each of those top five teams in more action for conference play this week. So excited to see how those teams are looking as we move forward. Um, and we'll be back next week and back on a, a regular schedule now that we are, are post-holidays for Her Hoops That's Unplugged. So looking forward to talking more NCAA basketball next week. That's all for this week's episode. Thank you for listening. As always, make sure you rate, like, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to or watching us. Also, be sure to subscribe to the stats site, herhoopstats.com, for all the NCAA basketball stats that you need. You can subscribe to our free newsletter on Substack as well, and be sure to be following us on social media at herhoopstats on all platforms. Thanks again for listening.